of this week, the 30th day of December, 2020, we should be in advance. I'm sorry, this is the core reporter. I can barely hear. I don't know if people need to mute or he needs to get closer to a microphone, but it's very faint. Like where I can't make a record. Can you hear me now? Sounds about the same. I will try to speak up so we can do. Thank you. This is the day set for the Canvas Compliance Board meeting, December 13, 2020. Uh, it's scheduled to begin at 9, 9 o'clock. It's now roughly 9.35. We had some technical audio difficulties this morning. Wishing everyone in the room and uh, Happy holidays. We can have uh, a call for our roll call. Uh, 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 Great. Member Mayor. Present. Member Durrett. Here. Dr. Young. Present. Member Nylander. Present. And Chair Present. Noting for the record that uh, we have some inability on Zoom this morning, so those people are not being connected. As to our formal agenda, I note for the record at the onset, under item three, consent agenda, item two is being removed and pushed over. Item number five, A, Libra Wellness Center, also is being pulled this morning. And the last item, which is item six, considered creation of proposed adoption amendments and repeal. Any public comment as to those items, I would ask to be held to that item so that item is taken. So that we hear the context within the context of the agenda. So that it's not a double speak on the same concerns that have been raised. So with that, the first item of business, item one, public comment in general or other agenda items. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, um, board. Uh, thank you to the board and staff of oh, my name. <laughs> My name is Nicole LaFong. I am here representing Minorities for Medical Marijuana, as well as the Chamber of Cannabis. Thank you to the board and staff for being so transparent during the independent consumption lounge selection process. The entire country has been and is still watching as the new licenses become reality. I would like to go on record and congratulate the EIC. Six of the graduates from their cannabis business school were selected for the provisional social equity independent license. Myself and the organizations that I serve with look forward to supporting these new business concepts in the marketplace. And I am thrilled to witness a new diverse group of owners enter the cannabis business space. That is because of the work we all did together to bring the right opportunities for business owners here in Nevada. I am excited to share that I recently received a promotion and will be taking a national role with Minorities for Medical Marijuana, no longer Western Regional Director. I will not be leaving Las Vegas, but I will be passing the baton into very capable hands, our new state co-directors, Judith Bacalik and Brian Martin. As we prepare for the new legislative session, we will partner with the chamber to begin advocating again, this time with a new Senate bill, thanks to Senator Dallas Harris, who on a side note, will be the guest speaker at the chamber luncheon this week. Together with Senator Harris, we plan to make history again here in the state by passing progressive legislation that will continue to diversify and develop the Nevada cannabis industry. We respectfully ask of the board that they continue an open dialogue with activists and industry leaders and begin implementing the solutions that you have been shared that have been shared with you, the regulators. This is how we continue to grow an innovative and sustainable industry. So not to worry, my new role will not take me away from all of the work, important work that needs to be done here in Nevada. I feel like we are just getting started. Thank you again to the board for all that you do, and I look forward to continuing the work together. 
Commission of Public Comment, Las Vegas. Good morning, board. My name is Tanya Haven. I am licensed to sell cannabis here in Las Vegas. Long-time cannabis advocate, and now I am now being sponsored by an amazing company called Four Four that is promoting me. I'm sorry, I can't understand the public oh, comments. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Yes, can you just speak clearly? It's there's a lot of background. It just sounds muffled in that room. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am being promoted to uh, run the Las Vegas Rock and Roll Running Marathon to promote the cannabis industry by this amazing company called Sports Corp. What I wanted to do today was to come up and say thank you to the board for what you do because if it wasn't for what you do, I now won't be able to do what I do. And it's not only this industry that helps, that I think is helping to save the world and not only has helped personally save my life, but it's the energy of everybody here that is giving me the power to do this run and um, help me promote it. So thank you very much for being in my room. Additional comments? Other comments? Last things. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rachel Lee. My company is Sunflower Compassion and Company. I wanted to say uh, thank you to the board. A miracle has happened in my life. I am a uh, prospective license uh, holder. Um, and so um, the story still continues. Um, I kept uh, saying, if you give it to whoever, what are they going to do with it? So I'm here standing before you to let you know that I'm going to do exactly what I said uh, and do with <clears throat> what was granted to me. Uh, this opportunity now gives me uh, the opportunity to assist kids in foster care and treatment centers uh, that already have an existing program to add an extracurricular activity added to their already existing program. For a couple of years, I worked for the state of Nevada with the Department of Child and Family Services, and I noticed that there was a lack with the individuals there and these systems and these treatment centers and, and the homes with them being able to go to play football, basketball, a little girl chilling around the room wanting to be in ballet, but she was not able to. So proceeds, if I'm able to continue on, will help and assist in a nonprofit organization called Safe Space, directly um, uh, issued to help kids in the system um, be a part of, and uh, also with the medical research. So I just wanted to say thank you, and I am going to do exactly what I say do for the community um, if the grant is continued on. Thank you. Additional public comment, Morning, board members. Attorney Judith Zakalik. Uh, you might see me as an attorney up here. You might see me as a licensee. Today, I'd like to introduce myself as co-director for the state of Nevada for Minorities for Mexican Marijuana, as Nicole Bavon has said. Uh, I look forward to working with you and um, helping grow this industry in a fair and equitable manner. Thank you so much. Additional comment, public comment, Las Vegas. Speaking right now, please. Can you please identify yourself? Sure, it's Kyra Kleinus for the record. 
Item 3A on the agenda concerns one complaint for disciplinary action. Pursuant to NRS 678A510, the Attorney General has reviewed this violation and has recommended proceeding with disciplinary action. In requesting the Board's approval to proceed with this disciplinary action, and if approved, I will authorize service of the complaint. As to Respondent A, the complaint will allege violations of NCCR Regulation 4, 6, 8, and 10. That will turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you. We've heard information as to the complaint item A1. All those in favor of the following respect to the report? If we could have a motion on that item. Member Dredd, I move to approve service of the complaint under Agenda Item 3A1. I would second that motion. Motion. Approval. We have a second. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, Member Dredd, please call the next item. Item 3A1, Complaint Number 4, Good morning, Chair and members of the Board. Uh, for the record, I'm Senior Deputy Attorney General Mike Detmer, um, and I have the pleasure of presenting for the Board's consideration Item 4A uh, for today's agenda, which is a proposed settlement agreement under Case Number 2021-49-CCB versus Green Cross of America. Uh, this matter arises from a summary suspension order um, that was placed on the respondent on or about August 26, 2021, um, as well as a disciplinary complaint that was later filed and served on the respondent on or about October 26, 2021. Uh, the allegations of the complaint, uh, which mirrored the basis for the summary suspension order, included five Category 1 violations, which included violations of operating a cannabis establishment without a, without a valid license, failing to admit CCB agents into a into an establishment as required um, and providing false statements to CCB agents. Um, it also involved 10 Category 2 violations for failing to maintain required security and or surveillance systems, uh, 15 Category 3 violations for failing to meet requirements related to the seat to sale tracking system, and 7 Category, category 4 violations for agents operating without a valid agent card. Um, in the aggregate, these violations could lead to a range of penalties that could include the revocation of the licenses as well as a civil penalty totaling $565,000. Uh, the terms of the agreement that is before the board today in proposed resolution of this complaint include respondents admission to one category one violation for operating an establishment without all required licenses, one category two violation for failing to timely renew a license, a second category two violation for failing to maintain a required security system, uh, one Category 3 violation for failing to follow seed to sale tracking requirements, um, a second Category 3 violation for storing or delivering cannabis outside the seed to sale tracking system, and three Category 4 violations for failing to have cannabis, established, a, cannabis establishment agents in possession of valid agent cards. Uh, the terms of the agreement also include that the respondent pay civil penalty totaling $300,000, that respondent sell the subject licenses. Uh, to a third party and that its current owners not retain any interest in Green Cross after the sale. Uh, that should the board approve this agreement, all current owners must surrender their agent cards in Green Cross. Um, additionally, should the board approve the agreement, the, licensee, the licenses will be reverted from uh, its, its suspended status to conditional status. Um, and further, the agreement also requires the respondent to complete a plan of correction. Um, as to this last term, the respondent has, has already submitted a plan of correction uh, which was reviewed and approved by the CCB staff and which is referenced in paragraph 25 of the agreement. Uh, in summary, this plan of correction included several provisions regarding the sale of Green Crosses as licenses to a third party, uh, the hiring and training of new staff and personnel, uh, their procurement of all necessary registrations, licenses, and or permits, uh, the installation and maintenance of all required equipment, including security equipment, um, and the already witnessed destruction of the cannabis found within the facility during the August 2021 inspection which, from which the violations arose. Uh, as this 
that the agreement is relatively lengthy. This is, of course, just a summary of the primary terms of the agreement, uh, with the full terms being provided within the document itself. Uh, these terms were reached with consideration of the facts and circumstances of the case, as well as factors of mitigation, which would include the aforementioned corrective actions, uh, respondents' cooperativeness during the disciplinary action, uh, respondents' admissions to the violations, as well as the requirements of the sale of Green Cross to a third party, and that the owners are divesting themselves of their agent cards and interest in Green Cross. Uh, with these considerations in mind, it is respectfully recommended that the Board approve this agreement. Um, I have, of course, available to answer any questions, uh, as well as counsel for the respondent, Mr. Derek Connor, um, and the respondent's receiver, Mr. Kevin Singer, who was appointed by the Board um, over Green Cross during its January meeting. And with that, I submit. Uh, good morning, Derek Connor, the law firm of Connor and Connor, on behalf of the respondent of Cross of America, Inc. Uh, Kevin Singer, the uh, Superior Court Receiver. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Denver did an excellent job summarizing the uh, history of this case. I'm sorry, is this back to Mr. Connor speaking? Yes, ma'am. My apologies. Derek okay, Connor. that's okay. And can you speak into the microphone? I, I can't see any of the room, so I can't see anybody in... Um, if you can get closer to the microphone, that'd be great. Understood. Uh, once again, Derek Connor, we just want to thank the CCB Deputy Attorney Generals and all the staff for their work on this matter. It's been a pretty long time coming. We're very happy with the result, and we look forward to uh, moving forward in accordance with the terms of the settlement agreement. Uh, Mr. Connor, you have a I'll just allow my uh, my counsel to speak for me today. Uh, it's just it's been a very long process, and uh, obviously my goal as an officer of the court is to uh, make sure your fines and penalties are paid, and bring you a a, a new, reputable, incredible operator of this facility who you will get to approve. Any questions uh, by the board? By board members? This, this is this is board member Nylander. Um, so, Mr. Connor, in paragraph twenty-five, uh, so there there's a receiver in place, and I know it's been a long journey, but uh, you recognize there's some conditions that are placed on the current licensee in respect of the sale, where there's they're gonna have, you're gonna have to communicate with the buyer uh you know those corrective actions in paragraph 25. Uh, this is Derek Connor uh, yes member Nylander we are aware of that and fortunately the third party buyer has retained competent count, uh, cannabis counsel uh they've retained Maggie McClutchy so we've been working with her on this matter and we have full confidence she'll be able to help them uh, get this across the finish line uh oh great Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Um, who is financially responsible to pay the fine? Is it will go through the receiver? Is it the owner? Do they have to come out of pocket? Uh, uh, Kevin Singer, the uh, court receiver. Uh, yes, the money will be coming uh, from them through the sales proceeds, which which they will not be uh, seeing the proceeds of the sale. Any other board members have questions? Any other questions? We have a motion on this matter. Mr. Draft, to approve the settlement agreement um, relative to agenda item four relating to Green Cross America. Do we have a second? Second. Any additional discussions? Okay. Questions. Uh, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Madam carries. Mr. Connor, Mr. Singer, thank you very much for helping to resolve this uh, rather complicated settlement agreement. I understand that you have a way to go and so 
Jeannie was back in the box. So thank you. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a happy holiday season, you and your families, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next year. Ditto uh, to what my counselor said. That will take us to the agenda item for five requests for transfers of interest, as indicated by the A group of illness that's going to continue. That takes us to item B, Panavated Farms, LLC. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, Chair. Chair Douglas, Member Merritt, Member Nylander, Member Garrett, and Member Young. For the record, I am David Staley, the Division Chief of Investigations for the CCB. I'm here to present agenda item number five, which consists of three transfer of interest or TY applications. Item A has been pulled. I'll move to item B. Item B are TUI applications by the Candidate Group LLC, which holds medical and adult use cultivation and production licenses in Reno. TOIs 2200020 and through 220023 were filed requesting approval for the acquisition of Candidate and its licenses by Top Strike Resources Corps, DBA, then Canada, a Canadian PTC. The acquisition will be completed through the subsidiary Ventana Acquisition Inc., which is a special purpose acquisition company. Current Canavate of owners, Scott Wire and Ross and Linda Klein, will acquire some ownership in Ventana through the conversion of Class E Canavate stock units, and Scott and Ross will serve on the Ventana Board of Directors. In addition, Van Canna has requested waivers pursuant to NCCR 5.112 and 5.125 of the requirements of NCCR 5.110 regarding a review of all owners. Van Canna has adequately addressed the items required in NCCR 5.112 and 125 to allow the board to approve such waivers. Staff suggests that if approved, the board limit Van Canna's 5.112 and 5.12 waivers to expire on the next agenda date for a Canada TOI application. No areas of concern were identified during this TOI investigation. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Ross Klein, David McGorman, John Sharon, and Jason Iwasik are available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Mr. Sherry, before you sit down, I'm sorry, I can't hear whoever's speaking. I'm Chair sorry Douglas. to keep interrupting. Chair Douglas, for the record, uh, Mr. Staley, I understand that uh, you have no problem with the request under NCCR 5.112, the way requirements regarding any transfer of ownership of less than 5%. No, sir, we have no concerns. Thank you. If we can have the licensees, if they are present, and uh... good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. representations, please. My name is David McGorman. I am the CEO and director of Pop Track Resources, DBA, Ben Canna. I'm John Sharoon, Executive Chairman and CFO of Vencana. I'm Scott Ride, Founder and Board Member of uh, Cannavative. Ross Klein, CEO of Cannavative. Steve Blackheart, Cannavative Transaction Advisor. Thank you. Any uh, comments uh, you wish to make to the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Member Nylander. I have a uh, just a question, if I might. So for the applicants, um, what's been your experience with the sort of creating a SPAC and then sort of how, what's your timing on an IPO? I, I suppose it's dependent upon the market, but just wanted to get your some notion of your experience with the SPAC. Uh, this is David McCormick, the CEO of Encana. Um, it is a special purpose company that is a subsidiary. Uh, for the purpose of it is just to acquire the shares of Canavative. It is not a SPAC as you would know it as a special purpose public company on NASDAQ. 
We are already I'm sorry, I, I can't hear what's going on. There was weird background noise all of a sudden. So to finish, uh, we are already um, trading on the Canadian Stock Exchange, which is uh, the most heavily traded stock exchange for U.S.-based cannabis operators. So there is not a market concern. What we do need to do is finish our audits that are acceptable to the Canadian Stock Exchange. So those are our requirements. Does that answer your question? It, it, it does, because I was a little bit... Um unclear on you know because there was some discussion about an ipo but it didn't seem like that was the purpose for the spac which is different from the us at least from what i'm used to in the gaming industry you know this the spac is a is a special purpose entity for one reason and yeah so i just it, it seemed a little bit odd so i thank you for your your uh, your answers that that explains it to me. Any other board member have a question? Mr. Chairman, this is Member Nylander. I would move for approval of um, agenda item five B as read into the record. Uh, and those waivers under Regulation 5 would be conditioned to expire on such agenda date as Top Strike Resources uh, is uh, next TOI application is on the agenda. Motion for approval. Do we have a second? Any additional questions or concerns? I was just going to ask how involved the Canada's beta founders are going to stay during the transition and going forward. Um, I'm happy to answer that. Again, it's David McCormick and Canada. They will be um, representing 40% of our board. Uh, the entire Canada team will be continuing. And what we're doing is adding um, our experiences and other opportunities to um, expand the cannabis opportunity uh, through other states. That answer. I'd just like to make one quick comment for the board. I want to call out Danny Sandrock, the investigator for TOI. She was outstanding to work with, really um, quickly responded to questions, was just really outstanding. So thank you to her. Second that. <laughs> All in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Days. That passes. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you. 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 <clears throat> Up here, but I'm going to ask you, if we can take a very short break, hopefully about a five minute break. Yes, sir. Uh, to see if we can correct our audio situation so we don't have feedback and uh, the court reporter can. This is Member Young. Can you hear me? Gentlemen, we will try to continue our meeting as soon as possible. Mr. Staley on TOIs. I'm sorry, are we back in session? We are back in session. Thank you. Chair Douglas, members of the board, for the record, my name is David Staley, Chief of Investigations for the CCB. Item C is a TOI application by Harvest of Nevada LLC, which holds medical and adult use conditional cultivation and production licenses in West Wendover. TOI number 21059 was filed requesting approval for Jasmine Sanu and Arshi Dillon through their entities, Green Enterprises LLC and Vertical Horizon LLC, to acquire 100% of the licenses held by Harvest of Nevada. No areas of concern were identified during this investigation. 
I am available for any questions. So my understanding is that Steve White, Jasmine Sandu, and R.C. Dillon are available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Just for purposes of public record, Mr. Staley, uh, going through what was provided to us, uh, I had not picked up the uh, part of the background uh, that we had a management service agreement, and it is stated in here as I, I see it second time, but that uh, also goes to the nature of how the sale was put together. Yes, sir. The uh, Verbal Horizon had a previously board approved management services agreement with Harvest of Nevada. My understanding is that they've been working to build out the property in West Landover, uh, waiting for the TOI process to be completed. And, and hopefully today that will uh, give them the uh, acquisition of the property and the MSA will no longer be required. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Chair Douglas, Director Klein, as members of the board, Alicia Ashcraft of the law firm Armstrong Teasdale. On behalf of the seller, Harvest of Nevada, uh, my understanding was that Jasmine Sandu and Arshdeep Dillon would be here. I, oh, very good. I'll uh, 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 let them introduce themselves, but uh, on behalf of the seller, Harvest of Nevada, happy to answer any questions you may have. I just want to say, RC, uh, this is Jasmine Sandu, managing member of Vertical Horizon uh, LLC. RC was supposed to be on Zoom. He's not in uh, Nevada at the moment. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, we are aware of our technical difficulties and challenges. Uh, with that, any of the board members have questions of council or licensee? Um, member, for the record, I what is the plan with the facility going forward? Because I was confused. A letter submitted by Steve White. So what are the plans? Is it to operate it? And yeah, the plan is to uh, finish the construction and then operate the facility once that's complete. Oh, thank and uh, member direct, thank you again for the record, Alicia Ashcroft. Uh, just uh, for purpose of uh, helping facilitate your recollection, last month at the November 15th meeting, uh, we would obtain an additional extension of time. If you recall, this was the facility where the ground is frozen. And so we're not able, uh, the, the buyer's not able to pour the pad just yet. And so we did uh, obtain for them an extension of time to November of 2013 to complete the construction and operation. Any other board member have questions? If not, can we get a motion? This is number young. I'll move that to approve item 5C. TY Harvest of Nevada and Vertical Horizons. Thank you, Member Young. Do we have a second? Yeah. Member Nylander, I would second that motion. We have a motion and a second from our Northern members uh, for Northern property. <laughs> With that, uh, we have any additional questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. I, I thank our licensee and I thank Attorney Ashcraft for contributions and making this uh, kind of seamless. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as Mr. Staley is making his way back up here for the next time, I just want to take an opportunity to thank the board members and wish you all and CCB staff and the Deputy Attorney General a very happy holidays and a bright new year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to also thank the CCB and everybody for the happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Douglas, members of the board, for the record, I'm David Staley, Chief of Investigations for the CCB. Item D are TOI applications by Healing Gardens LLC, Sensible Edibles LLC, and Washoe Dispensary LLC, which hold medical and adult use cultivation, production, and dispensary licenses in Washoe County. TOI number 21069 was filed requesting various ownership changes in parent companies, Common Sense Botanicals Nevada LLC and Common Sense Botanicals. The ownership changes do not impact the three licensees, but change the ownership structure of the Common Sense parent companies due to capital calls and removes, removal of some owners no longer interested in the cannabis industry. An early suitability review for a lounge license was also completed in conjunction with the investigation for TOI 21069.
This investigative report concluded that Common Sense Botanicals LLC is not only suitable for the requested TOIs, but is also suitable for the potential allowance license. The early review did not include specifics related to the operations and location of this proposed lounge, which will still need to be investigated by CCB audit and inspections after the lounge application period, along with a brief update from CCB investigations. No areas of concern were identified during this investigation. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Ed Alexander, Mark Bell, and Neil Duxbury are available to address any uh, questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Thank you. Do we have council or licensees uh, available up in Carson, I guess, today? Good morning for the record, Ed Alexander. Good morning. Questions or concerns uh, from the board? Mr. Chairman, this is member Nylander. I don't uh, have any concerns, but just wanted to ask Mr. Alexander sort of what his view of the market is right now and how are operations going for the company? Um, operations for our, thank you. Uh, that was Commissioner Malander. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malander, for the uh, question. Uh, the company is doing very well because we're vertical uh, from the industry standpoint. I think that there's some things that need to be addressed uh, in the upcoming session from taxation and, and uh, the various other levels of concern because it, it feels like uh, we're entering a, a, a very unknown period of, of industry strength yeah no i i appreciate that because it you know it's still a very new uh regulated industry and so i'm always curious about sort of what you see as the issues going forward i note from your background that you know you're a long time nevadan and uh this is <laughs> you know new new territory for everyone so I appreciate your comments. Um, and I do, you know, looking at your background, I wanted to commend you on the charitable work you're doing um, in a number of ways. So that's very much appreciated from the regulatory side that you're involved in a lot of things that, um, you know, that, that are that are very positive for your community. And I appreciate that. Thank you for that. I, I do think one thing that's important for us to discuss at some point is, is the ability for the industry to breathe. And I think that the consumption lounge regulations as proposed give some opportunities for that, but, but we also need to make sure that we're not overly restrictive. And you know, none, none of us really know what the future 36, 48 months from now may look like in a lounge space. So I, I don't think it's quite as granular as folks may believe it to be. So I would just ask that the, the CCB and, and local jurisdictions keep in mind that, you know, to, to hamper or somehow inhibit growth doesn't make a lot of sense at this point. So thank you guys for all the good work that you're doing. I do want to say one thing that uh, Chief Staley and uh, Jeff Justice were unbelievable to work with. I, I commend the entire CCB on the progress that you guys have made. It, it feels like a completely different organization than the one that we used to deal with. So from, from the industry standpoint, or at least from my standpoint, thank you for the transparency and, and thank you for uh, the willingness to work with license holders. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, this is member Nylander, you know, you're a fifth generation of Adam. Um, so if you think, and I come from the gaming background and, you know, we're trying to make it look like gaming to the extent it makes sense. Uh, but, but you know, the history, right? So uh, I, I hope when we make mistakes, you'll, recognize that we're growing too, as well as the industry. So, and I'm confident we can work together to get, you know, get everyone on the same track. And 
I would just note, Mr. Chairman, for the record that we have no areas of concern on this item, uh, nor did we, again, this is the second agenda in a row, that we didn't have any areas of concern. And I believe we've cleared the backlog that we inherited from the prior regulators. So, and Ty Tyler can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the backlog has been cleared. And so I think going forward, I, I hope that, you know, this board and the industry are lockstep together and we don't have areas of concern. And I would, again, just note, this is a very clean application. And uh, that that's, I couldn't say that two years ago, three years ago. So, um, and, and Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, has their backlog been cleared? This is, this is Tyler Clines for the record. That is correct, Chief Staley. I think you reported on that. And I think there's some still out there uh, assigned to some of our agents. But as far as uh, uh, the extended review period um, goes, uh, I believe we are, are now through those. Chief Staley can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, Chief Staley, it's a chance for you to take credit. <laughs> Chair Douglas, members of the board, Chief uh, for the record. Uh, when we started, uh, when this agency stood up approximately um, in what, July of 2020, we had approximately 90-ish TOIs that had been placed on hold. And during that time period, we had uh, acquired uh, or had been submitted another 60. During the last two and a half years, um, we've been able to put in some measures that I think help the industry and conditional TOIs were one. Uh, we've also made sure to recognize some of the difficulties in the industry uh, by establishing the receivership process and also uh, with an internal policy if there were uh, illnesses or, or deaths in ownership, we've pulled those forward to assist in um, estate planning and, and uh, maintenance of, of um, ownership structure. Uh, we also had in there, we had another type of application that came in. Uh, nonetheless, at this time, I believe that we have handled a majority of the 90 some odd that we inherited from uh, the, pri the prior regulators. We have continued to handle the applications as they've come in. Um, and uh, we have now just a handful that we received. Um, but that have not yet been assigned to investigative agents, and we have the capability to handle the consumption lounge applications coming in. Um, so we were looking at about a two-year lead time two years ago, and we're down to uh, somewhere in the area of a five- or six-month lead time when an application comes in. We were four, we're able to start processing it. Um, I will give a huge shout-out to my staff. This is not work that I did. Um, but this was the investigators that work for you and represent the board in the industry and uh, have handled a tremendous workload over the last two years. And, and that's really where uh, where all the benefits have come. Um, but I think that that's a pretty good Thank you. No, and I, I, I so much appreciate that. Uh, and as state employees, I'll, I'll buy you guys some more pizza. How's that? All right, thank you. That's the side. We had our time delay, so to speak. Um, do we have a motion? We had a motion on the floor. Mr. Okay. Chairman, this is Member Nylander. I would move for approval of item uh, 5D, Healing Gardens uh, TOI as stated on the agenda. I don't think we have any conditions on this at all. Member Durrett, I second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any additional discussion or corrections as the conditions? With that, all in favor, please say aye. 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 
passes unanimously. Uh, just as thanks, guys. Have a Merry Christmas and send some pizza up here, Commissioner Nylander. <laughs> yep, yep, I, it's coming, it's coming right now. <laughs> Is that cold pizza in Northern Nevada? Yeah, it's uh, in my refrigerator. I'm gonna FedEx it up there. <laughs> With that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold item six, which is proposed adoption, uh, just to kind of get through the other part of the agenda. Uh, consideration item number seven, consideration for approval to extend final inspection deadlines. We have two items. Thank you, Chair and uh, You and members of the board, Steve Miller, Chief of Administration for the record. I'm here today to present agenda item number seven. This is a condition submitted by conditional licensees to extend the February 5th, 2023 deadline to receive a final inspection by the CCB. Agenda item 7A is for Paul Can LLC. The Matter Organic Remedies LLC was issued a conditional adult use retail store license on December 5th, 2018 within the Carson City jurisdiction. At the August 25th, 2022 Cannabis Compliance Board meeting, transfer of interest number 21007 was reviewed and conditionally approved transferring the Nevada Organic Remedies license to Qualcan LLC. On June 27th, 2022, Qualcan was sent a final approval letter by the CCD reporting that all conditions of the TOI were met. On November 1st, 2021, Walton submitted its first request for an extension of the February 5th, 2022 deadline. Walton's request went before the board that is November 16th, 2021. The board granted an extension of Walton's conditional retail store license to February 5th, 2023. On November 3rd, 2022, Walton submitted a second request to extend the February 5th, 2023 deadline. In the latest request, Paul Cam reports that on September 15, 2022, the Carson City Board of Supervisors approved a petition which increased the number of cannabis retail stores from two to four, lifting the moratorium on the city's code, which only allowed for two retail stores, which also had to be co-located within, within the same premise to the existing medical marijuana dispensary. Carson City now allows for four retail stores, and they don't need to be co-located with the medical marijuana dispenser. Qualcan also reports that Carson City Planning Commission approved the special permit number LW-2022-0262, allowing for a cannabis retail store in the South Carson Street. I'm sorry, can you repeat that part? I hear papers, all I hear are papers um, moving. Chair, sure. Paul Kent also reports that Carson City Planning Commission approved a special use permit number LU-2022-0262, allowing for a cannabis retail store at 5100 South Carson Street. And this was approved at their September 28, 2022 meeting. Staff have communicated to Paul Kent that there are no areas of concerns and has asked that the licensee be prepared to discuss its progress at the board meeting. I'm available for any questions. Michael Castalli is present today to give a brief presentation address to any questions you may have as well. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Um, members of the board, Michael Castalli appearing on behalf of Qualcan LLC. Uh, Mr. Gilbert uh, correctly memorializes um, the status of the Carson City uh, license and its current use. The only thing that I would add in addition to that is this is a land development project with multiple uses. So you, we will be um, involved with construction um, and bringing utilities to the location. So it's not as if it's just a refit um, or a tenant improvement. This will be a ground up construction um, that will take some time in completing. Questions by the board. Uh, this is Member Nylander, Mr. Prasali. What um, 
what timeline are you looking at for the extension? So we would, uh, just based on our previous requests and the board's granting, uh, board member Nylander, um, we would anticipate a year extension. Um, I am it, that I am a little concerned uh, about that timetable in light of the fact that it is a ground up construction project uh, with multiple uses, uh, but we are going to do what we can to advance it as far as we can um, uh, going forward. Um, but I cannot uh, tell you because I haven't consulted with our construction uh, crew um, uh, as of today. So I'm um, certainly more than happy to update the board uh, if the board uh, would like to be updated uh, on the progress uh, throughout the construction phase going forward. Yeah, so in our materials, it indicates you're requesting through February 5th of 24. Um, is, is that is that what you're you're thinking, you know, and then you could come back and ask for an extension, I suppose, but that'll give you, you know, a little over a year. Yes, that is correct, um, Board Member Nylander. Um, we think that we, we, we hope and anticipate the project be complete by then, and we have final licensing um, and uh, approvals both in the local uh, jurisdiction and by the state as well. Okay, no, understood. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I'm not. Uh, I think that 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 syncs it with some of the other applications that February fifth, uh, you know, date. Uh, so we can hear these kind of all at once if we need to. Hopefully, we don't need to, but would like to get your thoughts, Mr. Chairman. Just checking with. Uh... Our, our regulatory agency in terms of the date to keep it in sync, but it sounds like progress is being made now that uh, Carson City has gotten on board with time and hopefully the next time we see you, even though we did haven't have had a motion, either the project will be completed or you can tell us how close to completion you are uh, to get additional time. But uh, in terms of uh, the date, is that the date that we've been going with for extension? I believe the date for the last extension has been November 5th, 2023. Is that correct, Chief Gilbert? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. November 5th, 2023. I would recommend that we, from my standpoint, stay with that date as to an extension, uh, just to make it ease for everything else that we have to look at in terms of these kinds of licenses. It doesn't put any undue pressure, hopefully, on the the applicant, uh, because we're prepared to hear hopefully very positive things in terms of construction uh, going forward of, of a multi-use facility after the ground unfreezes up in Carson. Yes. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, unless there's something else we need to hear, if we can get a motion for the extension to November 5, 2023, understanding licensee will come back with very good news that they're completed or news that uh, they say have begun the process of construction and building. Mr. Chairman, I would make that motion with respect to item. This is Member Nylander, I'm sorry. Uh, with respect to item 7A, uh, it would be the extension for the deadline would be 11 5 2023. Okay, do we have a second? Chair, Member Young, I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded by Mr. Young, so the North has struck again. With that, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Happy holidays, Mr. Cristalli. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert, as well. That takes us to item B, Deep Roots Harvest. Thank you, Chair. Agenda item 7 is for Deep Roots Harvest Incorporated. Deep Roots Harvest Incorporated or Deep Roots is issued a conditional adult use retail store license on December 5th. 2018 within the Henderson jurisdiction. On October 14, 2021, Deep Roots submitted its first request for an extension of the February 5, 2022 deadline. Deep Roots request went before the board at its November 16, 
2021 meeting, the board granted an extension to its conditional replace for license on February 5th, 2023. On November 30th, 2022, you submitted a second request to extend the February 5th, 2023 deadline for final inspection. The Henderson City Ordinance 4.118070 is still in place, which requires a co-location for a medical and adult cannabis facility. Because it continues to discuss with discussions between the council and Henderson City Council members. These discussions include tours of each groups, other operating facilities, as well as assessments of the cannabis tax revenue loss by the city. Ecruits is currently scheduling meetings with Mayor Lack, City Council members, to discuss an amendment to the ordinance to remove the co-location requirement. Staff have communicated to Ecruits that there are no areas of concerns and has asked that the licensee be prepared to discuss its progress with the board meeting. I'm available for any questions. I'm Lori Rogich and John Marshall are present today to do a brief presentation and address any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, appearances and Ms. Rogich. Good morning, Chairman Douglas, members of the board, Director Plymouth, Chief Gilbert. My name is Lori Brogish. I'm here on behalf of Deep Roots Office Inc. With me today is John Marshall. Mr. Marshall is an owner and the Chief Operating Officer of Deep Roots. Last year, this board requested that we return with an update as the Henderson Moratorium. In that regard, while the moratorium on independent retail stores is still in effect, next month, Councilwoman and Mayor-elect Michelle Romero and Councilwoman-elect Carrie Cox will be sworn in. The council has the option of appointing the vacant seat or calling for a special election. We then expect the council as a whole will guide the cannabis industry as to whether the moratorium will be lifted. We anticipate such guidance to occur in the next month, next few months, and we will continue to work with the Henderson City Council and the mayor elect to that effect. We appreciate the board's understanding and consideration that Deep Roots has expended significant time and resources to perfect this conditional license. As a result, we respectfully request an extension of time for our Henderson license. The grant of an extension would be consistent with the consideration given other licensees, which is an extension to November 5th, 2023. And if the moratorium is lifted, a 14 month extension after the date the moratorium lifts. Thank you for your consideration, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions by the board members. Uh, Chair Douglas, for the record, uh, from my standpoint, I understand the difficulties you've been having. Uh, we'll see what the new year brings. Uh, we'll be excited to hear about that. I guess for us, it's it's eventually uh, <coughs> we have to do something with this. So hopefully uh, next year we'll take the licensee off the hook. But uh, with the co-jurisdiction in terms of development, it's up to the local entity to allow you going forward and we understand that. So we wish you well working with it. Um, I think we should grant you the year extension um, to see what happens, but that's just me. We'll see what happens if we have a motion by board members uh, to go forward with this. Um, for the record, yeah, I like to say that Obviously, there may be a change in the approach going forward with the new mayor, but if there isn't, I think we need to have some serious discussions about these licenses. Um, I move to approve the extension to November 5, 5 2023. Second. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion, Aye. motion carries. Thank you very much. Good luck. And uh, hopefully the new political season will be beneficial for you. Yes, thank you. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Next item is item number eight, consideration for future meeting dates for hearing. In the case of Cannabis Compliance Board versus Canix Nevada et al. Uh, for the record, I've received a document I requested from our agency as to available dates 
to do the second part of that hearing. I will be mailing out the document that indicates that the hearing room, and I've scratched out two dates already, the second and the fourth of January of next year, but there are a number of dates, five, nine, 17, 18, 19, 23, 25, 30 in January, or some dates in February, the second, the sixth, the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 22nd, and 27th, or following our January 24th board meeting. Now this, for the record, is a continuation of the board's uh, consideration of the appeal of Canex as the decision of the hearing officer. Uh, we heard a motion to dismiss previously and rendered a decision that was mailed out. Uh, this is now to move forward with the remainder of the <coughs> appeal by the licensee of the disciplinary action. So we need to get this scheduled. So this document mailed out, I'll, I'll ask you to uh, circle or, or give, give to Mr. Tyler or to myself four dates that work so we can hopefully then single down to one for additional hearing as of this matter. But this is to get it posted up and notice that it'll be mailed out or emailed out to the parties to respond and the board members. So you didn't have to take copious notes of me going through the dates. We'll move the agenda at this point. Um, we'll come back to the item of the day, item number six, consideration of proposed adoption amendments and or repeal of Nevada cannabis compliance regulations. And we will not try to take this in one bite, we'll take it in pieces. Morning, Chair and members of the board. Michael Miles, I'm the Deputy Director of the Campus Points Board. September 27th, 2022 board meeting in response to White Pine County's petition to amend Regulation 5, the board directed staff. I'm, I'm sorry, can you slow down a little? And I hear a lot of paper shuffling also next to a microphone. I'm not sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, at the September 27th, 2022 board meeting in response to White Pine County's petition to amend Regulation 5, the board directed staff to amend Regulation 5 to allow counties that don't have medical cannabis cultivation or production facilities a process for those counties to get these medical marijuana locations in accordance with NRS 678B.220, subsection 3. As, su as such, we have prepared the following changes to Reg 5, which would allow counties that don't have a medical cannabis cultivation or production facility a process to obtain such medical marijuana establishments. First change was to NCCR 5.020. was updated to include all cannabis establishments and the new licensing procedures rather than just consumption markets. NCCR 5.025 and 5.030 were repealed as these regulations are no longer NCCR 5.035 was updated to create a process where counties can petition the board for a medical cannabis cultivation or production facility pursuant to NRS 678B.220, subsection 3. NCCR 5.040 was updated to include all cannabis establishments in the new licensing procedures rather than just consumption levels. Also updated with a few housekeeping matters from lessons learned from the last licensing round. NCCR 5.045 was updated to include all cannabis establishments and new licensing procedures rather than just consumption lounges. NCCR 5.050 was also updated to include all cannabis establishments and new licensing procedures rather than just consumption lounges. Um, do you have any questions? We'll, we'll come back to questions, I guess, at this point. What I'd like to do now is to allow for public comment. And we received from White Pine County itself a letter and their concerns. We additionally have received a letter from the Nevada Cannabis Association. But if anyone wants to come up to the microphone here in Las Vegas and make comment, please do so at this time. 
Good morning, Chair Douglas, Executive Director Klimas, and the same members of the board. For the record, my name is Brianna Padilla, and I am with the Chamber of Cannabis. I wanted to thank the board and their staff for their continued work with our industry, and also for seeing and prioritizing the need to, amendment, to an amendment to Regulation 5, particularly as it relates to creating a process that allows underserved communities to better access cannabis products and our industry the opportunity to grow so that it may satisfy the needs of the communities we are intended to serve. I would, however, like to echo concerns denoted in other public comments submitted as it relates to the potential for the lottery system used for lounges to be applied to these new licensees, should the application process result in more applicants than licenses available. Instead of opting for this approach when dealing with multiple applicants, I'd like to encourage the board to lean toward the legislative policy of awarding licenses according to merit as outlined in NRS 678B.240 and NRS 678B.28, as opposed to applying use of the lottery system for consumption lounges established in NRS 678B.371. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board, staff. My name is Amanda Connor from the law offices of Connor and Connor. I'm commenting today as a cannabis attorney expressing concern that the proposed regulations do not adhere to the statutory requirements. Um, as other public comments have noted, um, specific statutes related to um, issuing of licenses of cannabis establishments, except for lounges, require specifically that they be done on the basis of merit. Only in NRS 678B.327 when addressing the issuance of lounge licenses is a lottery permitted. And all the others require that the board issue the application or the licenses on the basis of merit in the statute. Therefore, I'd ask that the board reconsider um, these proposed regulations to make sure they stay within the statutory confines. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Hello, Will Adler for the record, representing Silver State Government Relations. I'd like to refer you back to the letter from uh, County Manager Mike Weevil, uh, which the chair has uh, obviously uh, read. That does uh, dictate some of the same concerns we've heard today. I would like to also ditto uh, Amanda Connor in the Chamber of Canvas's comments. Uh, the intent of the lounge language was to create a new process to ensure that you know the randomness of who applies would also be seen in the randomness of who won. And the lottery system was chosen for that, that aspect because of the uh, idea that there would be an increased desire to see lounges and and more applicants than the limited number of licenses allocated. Uh, specifically for White Pine County's application, uh, it is the application for a cultivation and production facilities. Uh, as, as said before, those should be based upon merit and uh, or given out multiple licenses as those not capped license categories. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Additional public comment. Good morning, Chair Douglas, Chair Douglas members of the board and Director Plymouth. Lake Martin, on behalf of the Nevada Cannabis Association, we you received our detailed comment in our letter, so I'll just hit the highlights um, and reiterate in the comments that have been made. The amendment to 5.0451 would allow for a lottery system for all license types. The lottery was authorized for lounges in 8341, but not for other license types. For all other license types, the statute still requires that the board consider and weigh merit when issuing licenses. And the CCB is seeking to modif modify these statutes in the next legislative session, but as it stands today, the existing statutory framework requires that the board use a merit-based evaluation process for non-lounge applications. Um, if the board moves forward today, it should, we would ask, revise that, that section to limit it just to consumption lounges, or in the alternative, we ask the board to consider addressing this and the rest of the proposed amendments in a public workshop so we can discuss this further. Thank you. Additional public comment in Las Vegas. Thank you, Chair Douglas and David Goldwater, representing um, my dispensary and you'll find cannabis dispensary as well as the, the, the little hodgepodge of Nevada Dispensary Association members who have not acted formally on this. Uh, there's a letter in your filed on this subject and I'll refer you to that. And I'd like to associate uh, some Me Too comments with Amanda Connor. I think with the legislative session so close, 
you might be well advised to take this policy matter up in a few months when the legislature convenes as to whether or not we have a merit basis in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment as to this item in Las Vegas? Going to Carson City. Do we have anyone in the north wishes to make public comment? There does not appear to be any public comment, Carson City. Thank you. Open it up to discussion uh, amongst board members as to the proposal and the comments and uh, what the various board members think or feel. Um, member Drett, for the record, um, I think that counter argument to saying that it uh, needs to be merit based is going to be that you can do a lottery and merit based. But I think we need to have more discussion of what that would look like in in reality. And uh, one of the letters stated. Um, the industry as a whole is not paying attention to this issue because we're not planning to issue licenses. Uh, we're not going through a licensing round anyway. Maybe there will be one in the right time, but we're not going through a licensing round. We need the stakeholders in this industry to be paying attention and come to the table with the discussion. I, I trust them to have good input that we need to hear. Um, these are attorneys, founders of uh, nonprofits, doctors, former gaming executives, um, smaller businesses, community members, and I want to know what they have to say about changing the landscape of the industry that they've been invested in for six plus years. Um, <clears throat> we, our merit-based ranking system did withstand scrutiny. I'm not saying it was perfect. We should improve upon it. Um, maybe there is some somewhere in there that a lottery could be utilized, but again, it needs to be in conjunction with the merit-based system that's already been established. Um, or that needs to be changed at the upcoming legislature. We have uh, in place a merit-based system. We're, we're jumping the gun by now changing it to a lottery with the legislative session next in two months from now. Um, I also think a, a major issue with this language is that it needs to separate the dispensaries from the cultivations and productions. The cultivation and production licenses are based on, and this has been the policy for since inception, based on um, the need for them. Dispensaries have been limited since the beginning. Maybe they will be expanded. Maybe they'll be expanded based on need. Maybe they'll be expanded based on the market, um, the market study. But these are two different license types. They need to not be lumped together, or at least we need to have a thorough discussion on how uh, whether now we are just going to treat them the same. And I have a question. Does um, does this apply to distributor licenses? It says all cannabis establishment licenses. It doesn't give an exception for distributors. Is there somewhere in the, the NCCR that there would be an exception for distributor licenses? Because why would we do a lottery for distributor licenses? The only reason we do a lottery for anyone, if, if there's more applicants than we have licenses we're setting out, we do an all the way around, there wouldn't be a lottery system. But we don't, and, and that wouldn't, I mean, there's just no, problem with the distributor licenses, so they don't need to be lumped into this. So I think everything needs to be taken license type by license type. I would, I would argue that if you keep calling it a lottery system, but it's not actually a lottery system. This is a two-part application process. One, you had the application that you fill out, you meet a minimum criteria. At that point, everybody who met that minimum criteria goes into a drawing, goes into a random number selector based on how many licenses we have available. We're, this time for consumption lounges, it was 20, 10 independent, 10 social equity. They're still in the application process at this point. They do not have a license. Now they move on to the suitability check, which is the merit based check of the lounge license procedure. This whole procedure initially was put together for considering all licenses, not just consumption lounge licenses. And it's also based on lessons learned from the prior lawsuit as well. But not necessarily with industry input, because that was the problem with that proposal going in with consumption lounges. At least that's what, why I disagreed with it going in with consumption lounges. It was, this is getting lumped in with consumption lounges, and nobody's even aware that now the entire process for establishments is going to be changed because they're paying attention to establishment licenses. And like I said, I did anticipate that was going to be the response that, well, this is a merit-based, this is, we do have a merit-based calculation here. It, 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 we, we have a hybrid, again, that is not necessarily hashed out fully. And I think there needs to be discussion on it. 
if you have so if you have a small jurisdiction there's two uh, applicants for one license one is extremely well qualified the other isn't but passes the minimum standards it should be up to that lo local government to be able to determine or, or have some say in, in who's going to go in their jurisdiction who's going to bring tourism who's going to bring business who's going to bring jobs who's going to bring tax money so um, again I think no matter what the response is on uh, to um, well, this system does include merit. It's well, the stakeholders deserve uh, an opportunity to further discuss that. And there's there's very smart people out there that can that can weigh in. We have former lawmakers, we have policymakers, we have leaders throughout the state that can provide um, some insight into potential consequences. And there's no rush. We have a legislative session coming. Why does this need to be done today? We don't have legislative rounds coming up. I, I, I know White Pine is looking to get a license, but even they are saying that this um, is not ideal. So I would really appreciate if we would not go forward on this and would do a public workshop. Other board members. If no other board member wishes to speak, I will speak on my own behalf. Uh, I think we should go forward with this proposal at this time. To be quite frank, uh, the first licensing round that occurred, there was a great deal of criticism about mayor ranking, favoritism, insider trading, that's still in litigation. What are we, four years down the road? Hasn't been finally settled. Um, and the question is, uh, when you start ranking subjectively, uh, it's problematic. And the other question as a licensing board, are we cutting out a segment of the Nevada population or other individuals who wish to do business in Nevada? Because in ranking, as was put forth, well, we've been doing this, we do it better. In some cases, you don't know what someone can do until they're given an opportunity to do it. And by arbitrarily possibly cutting them out on some of the merit-based criteria, uh, it's unfair to citizens and residents of the state of Nevada, as well as other individuals who wish to get in our marketplace. Um, also, it becomes very transparent what we are doing. It's not a question of what got done in the back room. And that's something that still is hanging over our head in the industry. What got done in the back room? Looking nationally at what's going on, uh, the system that was used previously, um, there are a lot of litigation still going on. Uh, in particular, the state of New York, portion of their licenses, uh, they've held because of action by the court. So every day I pick something up and I see other things. We are trying to be transparent. We are trying to provide an opportunity for everyone in this state, if they so choose to get in this mix. I applaud our existing licensees for what they are doing and how they are conducting business. But the only constant in life is change. You represent your interest. We, the board, are supposedly representing the interest of anyone in Nevada not just the vested interests of those who've gotten in the business. Some of the, the laws that have been provided to us based on second round or third round have kind of given you an extra leg up. Personally, I think that's wrong, but we are the board and we also have to abide by what our legislature creates and work within that fashion. So we are attempting to do that within this two-prong event. Uh, I appreciate what Member Tourette said, and I too will be looking to the legislature. But I think at this time we can go forward with the limited application in this one area or the one county that's come forward and ask us to move. Uh, and if the legislature sees fit, they will carve out new instructions or tell us Go back and read what we told you before. Uh, but that's just my opinion. 
I don't know if any other board member wishes to weigh in now. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is member Nylander. Um, no, I agree with your comments. I think, uh, you know, the board has come so far uh, from all the things we inherited, um, including the original licensing round, which became, you know, World War Weed, as I recall it, uh, in the litigation. And the consumption lounge uh, regulations, at least so far, I think they've worked well. And I think it, it seems to me like, you know, staff is mirrored, you know, this regulation based on that. And, you know, that was a fair process. I, I think I've not heard anyone say it was not fair or, or, or was not transparent, which is different from the original licensing round. And so I, I think we've come miles away from that. And so the regulation seems to be in order to me, but I, I'm not opposed to, you know, having a workshop if, if, if that's necessary, but I mean, this isn't, it, it's a unique situation where we have one County that's, you know, wanting to do, you know, at least a medical, I guess, a medical license at first. And, and the statute does seem to allow, for, you know, well, almost require it uh, for medical only. But, but I also think it is, it is a hybrid as, as Mr. Miles said, you know, you, you, you still got to go through suitability. So, so it's not, you know, it's not totally random. You, you still got to prove, you know, the burden of proof is on the applicant to prove they're suitable. And, and that's true at both the uh, local and the state level. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to go to a work, you know, if we have to have a workshop, that's fine. I'm okay with that, but I'm also okay with the regs, uh, the draft regs as written. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's where I'm at. Thank you, other board members. Well, I would say that um, I would like to also make that same uh, comment, you know, that uh, having a workshop and hearing more voices is always good. Uh, there are some definitely good points made by uh, the, the chair, which I agree with him. And I also agree <coughs> with uh, you, Member Direct, that there are also issues within your statement that are, that are correct. So maybe a workshop going forward would have us um, to help us hear more voices, but there are correct points on both issues. It, and uh, Chair Douglas, I also would agree with <coughs> with those comments. Um, and you know, punting it to the legislature is one thing, uh, but you know, just my personal view, you know, the legislature has not given us a lot of guidance. So, I mean, it, it may be worse if we <laughs> go back because, you know, the whole, there's a bunch of, I don't, every agenda every month is, you know, the, the statutes are pretty murky in a lot of ways and, and maybe we can get them clarified you know, this coming up session, but uh, this whole notion of medical versus rec and how that transitioned and the whole vetting of the licenses initially and now is it's all very different now. So we, we, we could use some guidance statutorily from the legislature and that would be appreciative on my side. Um, but uh that that hasn't happened so far so i hope it does happen so that's all i have on that 
Can I follow up, Chair? <clears throat> I do agree with the sentiment of removing subjectivity, and, and I completely understand this is merit-based and lottery. Again, what I want is to see the many, many stakeholders in this have a say. And if we have a public workshop and they don't show up, so help me God, let's never do another public workshop. But I think they need to be on meaningful notice and they need to have the opportunity to have input. Um, and I, the only, this is not a criticism of the system that's being proposed or the sentiments behind it. The only thing I think needs to change is the, they need to be considered separately, dispensaries and cultivations and production, productions. Other than that, I'm not criticizing the proposal. It's just that I think we need to have a public workshop and consider the license type separately. Other members wish to weigh in? Uh, as the last comment, Chair Douglas, for the record, uh, twofold. One, right now, we're not talking about other licenses. We're talking about a single type of license in one jurisdiction. As to the other, in, in reality, I saw the, the head shake and I was like that. Uh, we're not authorized or have authorized to go forward with other licensing rounds at this point. So there's still time to make additional changes or the legislature to weigh in before that even happens. Uh, and I would be more than happy to consider if we were allowed to advance additional uh, licenses to look at this and change it. The other concern though, I am struck by is the verbiage that was used by uh, board member Durrett. Uh, again, I value the input of the licensees, but they're not the only constituency. The people of the state of Nevada, we license the industry. The industry doesn't license the licensees. Mm -hmm. Biggest concern that I have. Yes, your voice is important, but we should be allowed to let any player who shows their bona fides to meet the requirements come in if they are so warranted or allow the existing licensees to go forward. <clears throat> but to exclude populations based upon some, I'll just say arbitrary guidelines that were set up and will be impact built upon to say, we're better because we've been in business uh, is problematic and that is the one albatross hanging over the industry at this time and the one criticism and it has nothing to do with our social equity what it does have something to do with this equity across the board or folks who would like to get into this marketplace period Okay. Yes. Okay. Because I do, I do want to clear that I, I of course don't think the licensees' opinions are the only ones that matters. That's why I think we should have a public workshop to let um, other members come and advise as to how they would be affected by this. Other members of, you know, Nevada communities. Public workshops are nice. They're good. But if the only thing you're going to do is come forward and tell us we're wrong and we shouldn't change thing one, mm -hmm. they're a waste of good time. I'll just be blunt about it. And today, what I'm hearing is we want to stick with the old rounds and we want to stick with merit selection. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and I have a problem with that personally. But I'm one voice. So it's up to the board to decide whether they wish to, at this point, uh, adopt what's on, on the floor or ask for a, uh, another data, just public information, public hearing debate. So that's kind of what we're coming down to. So uh, if someone wishes to make a motion to one or the other or something in between, it will be put forth and we'll see if we can get a second and uh, do whatever needs to get done. Member Dredd, um, thank you very much for having the opportunity to discuss this and be able to have multiple times to discuss it. Um, I, I really appreciate that the board was willing to hear me out on this and consider people's requests for a public workshop on this. I'm going to move to 
um, hold a public workshop on it. Um, and if, I will not be offended if it if I lose my motion, but I'm going to move to for that. I have a motion to continue this for a public workshop, and do we have a second? I have a second. We have a motion. We have a second. We have any additional discussion as this. Hearing none, if we can have the vote of the board. I. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may comment quickly, uh, I think there's a hybrid solution that we go ahead and have the public workshop, but that we um, expeditiously put the regulation on the agenda if there's no major concerns. Um, so. I just, I guess I'm suggesting a condition, uh, you know, because the, in my view, there is a vetting process that will happen for every, and I'm not even talking about just White Pine County, but every county, we know we'll have to vet the licensing process, not, not just for medical, but I, I assume the goal here is to go to a rec uh, you know, application and those will all be under our jurisdiction. So I would, um, and I, I don't want to make it a condition. I'm sorry. That's the wrong term, but, uh, I'm comfortable with the regulation where it is, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to oppose having a workshop. So for the, uh, Ms. Member Young, hold, hold just as an island, just for the record. So you would be saying yes for the record of the public workshop. Yeah, I don't think that is going to hurt anyone. So uh, uh, we have bigger issues to, you know, to discuss. So if 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 it's a workshop, you know. That's that's fine, but I, and again, I agree with your comments that it may not get us anywhere, but I guess it can't hurt us either. So, Member Young, this is Member Young. Do the workshop and the approval of the regulations have to be mutually exclusive? Can could you not approve them and then still have a workshop to take a look at them? I just I, I'm, I'm concerned that this is obviously a white pine issue which is largely what this came from, that just delays things further down the road. And certainly I can tell you from item B, regulation 12, that you know, two years later, we're kind of still working on this. I'm just concerned that this is just going to keep pushing, you know, kicking the can down the road. I think the motion, Chair Douglas, for the record, I think the motion that's been put forth at this time is to, in essence, hold the regulation uh, to have the workshop and because of White Pines County, we would still be trying to expeditiously do whatever we're going to do following that workshop. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Member Nylander. Uh, what if we approved it, approved the regulation, um, and we just, but we put the, the effective date somewhere out in like the end of January? And then we could always recall it, and I may need some help from our our lawyers on that, or from you, Mr. Chairman. But if we if we made the effective date, you know, later, so that we could get more public input, and that may help Member Durrett, uh, you know, so make the effective date, you know end of January or something. And then we, we could get more of a sense of. Um... I understand where you're going. I guess the secondary part of that is the effective date of the ordinance. And I'll ask Tyler to, to just kind of give us logistics of how long does it take if in fact we get more than one applicant for the white pine license, does it take to set up a drawing to understand what the time frame 
becomes. Sure, so uh, the requirements uh, dictate that we open up the licensing round for 10 days, correct? So we would have to, is there a 30 day notice attached to that? Correct. So there's a 30 day notice that we would have to send to open up an application window. That application window would be 10 days. And at that point, we could hold the random num number selection event uh, at any time. If we were to receive more applicants than licenses available, we could open that up at any time, no other requirements. And then following that, it's, it's a matter of a, of a suitability review and board approval. So if I understand correctly, then 30 days from the effective date of this going into effect, you'd have to give notice for. And then 10 days thereafter, opening of the license rounds before you would know whether or not there are multiple individuals requesting. That's right, if I heard you, and I'd, I'd like to answer one more thing. You know, it does cost money, of course, to um, bring in the equipment um, to perform the random number selection. And so, um, you know, there, there could be an IFC piece in there, but we would have to see, maybe we get a discount because we've already done it once, but we would have to look at that. <laughs> so in effect, for the white, Hines County situation right now, instead of looking at a possible February event to determine potential licensees, we would probably be looking at a March or April if we have a public work, a workshop. That's to, to answer kind of the questions Mr. Miner was asking about finessing what's on the table at this point. We still have a motion on the floor, but that's part of the discussion. So I don't know if that changes anyone or not. Um, and I didn't have a total resolution of where Dr. Young was for or against. So uh, we need to have that as we're trying to process this. This is, this is Member Young. I would say that I am, I'm for the change in regulation. So uh, if the, Motion is to pose to take to table that so that we can have a workshop and I, I vote against. And for the reasons I've so stated, I, I would vote against a public workshop at this time as the singular license. But having said that, the motion for a public workshop does carry three to two. So I will leave it to Director Kleinless to set up uh, a workshop at a reasonable time since we're into the holiday season. That will then move us to item number 2A and CCR 5.025. And number four, Eric Cronkite, Chief of Alderman Inspection for the Record. Agenda item 6B, one proposes updated regulation changes to. Excuse me, can you start over, please? I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Kara Crockheit, Chief of Audit and Inspection for the record. Agenda item 6B, subsection 1, proposes updated regulation changes to NCCR 12.065. Based on the feedback that was received after the CCB requested recommendations on language for the label. After reviewing all public comment and recommendations, the proposed language has been revised and it now reads, if any cannabis or cannabis product has been treated with any thermal process, ionizing radiation, chemical, or other processes approved by a board agent for the purpose of reducing or eradicating microbial contamination at any time post-harvest, the label must include the following statement. This product has been treated with method of, method of treatment for the purpose of reducing microbial contamination in bold lettering. This must appear on any label leaving cannabis establishment once the cannabis or cannabis product has undergone treatment. This treatment does not, this requirement does not apply to cannabis sent to extraction after failure of laboratory analysis as a method of remediation, as long as it is labeled in compliance with NCCR 12.035, 
1L and NCCR 12.0451M. We did risk, so now just to clarify, the label would state the words, this product has been treated with, and then you would insert the method of treatment, um, such as ozone, x-ray, UV, or a specific chemical. Um, we received some concern of the burden of additional language on a label. I'd like to clarify that NCCR 12 requires that a label must be affixed to or included with a package. For example, this could be something like a um, QR code that is affixed to the package or included with the package. Um, a handout would be acceptable as well. Um, or even, say you have an exit bag, the label itself could just be placed inside of the exit bag with the cannabis or cannabis products. Um, additionally, I would like to clarify that the method of treatment on the label would be something like ozone, x-ray, UV, radio frequency, heat, or a chemical's common name. The facility would not be required to specify the exact brand of equipment or um, the exact chemical unless they want to do so. Um, I will now turn it back to you, Chair, and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Public comment as to this item. And we are dealing with 5.025, um, which is different if you're standing up as to no, we're dealing with 12. Right? 065. <clears throat> We are dealing with 12. We're here on 12. We're, we're not on 1265. We were. We did not want Let's take the comments also because it's a similar application. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, I'm Nick Pulis, part owner and um, GM of THC Nevada Cultivation. Um, First, I'd like to start off that any treatment methods used are approved treatment methods for a reason, because they are safe and effective. Um, with this updated label language, I have a question. What is the difference between pre-harvest microbial decontamination and post-harvest? Um, and why, why is the label required for just the post-harvest decontamination? Um, it seems as though you agree that this would be misleading to add all fungicides and pesticides to the label. Um, that happened pre-harvest by changing the language to this label, to this label only requiring post-harvest treatment. Um, how do you justify that post-harvest treatment is any different and more important information for the consumer that is needed to go directly on every product label? Um, it was already decided that treatment methods were to be disclosed on the soil amendment by the legislation. Previously, that's where pesticides and organic sites are all currently um, listed. Um, so why should post-harvest treatment be any different and labeled any differently? It is misleading. Since I believe there is no difference between pre or post-harvest treatments, this proposed language fits perfectly to go on the soil amendment with the other decontamination methods, organicides, fungicides, pesticides. This is the whole purpose of the soil disclosure. Um, you can put on the CCD website or email blast or tweet to inform the public that if they are interested in information on their cannabis products to simply ask the dispensary for the soil disclosure or lab results, which will be provide them all the information they need. Um, if this current language is approved, this label will significantly negatively affect the entire legal industry, not just cultivation, but at the dispensary level as well. It is misleading and will reduce the demand for clean, legal, taxed, lab-passing flour. Um, <clears throat> why would the board want to put something in place that would deter the sale of illegal cannabis simply because it's misleading to the consumer? Please do not make it harder to sell clean, legal, uh, legal cannabis than it already is. The unintended consequences of this label are that it will send people possibly to the black market. Now, I've had employees and people tell me they would rather consume black market product over something with a scary label on it. So something like it. it's been, you know, extra radiated. Um, another thing is this, with this label in, in, in place, if it does deter the consumer from buying, which I believe it will, 
Um, you're telling the cultivators not to use safety and cleaning processes because it'll make it extremely difficult for us to sell our processes, product with the label on it. In closing, I'm asking that we, that this verbiage, which I, I think is fine, would, uh, should be added to the most reasonable place it should be, which is on the soil disclosure that is sent out with every order and available at the dispensaries for anyone to view. I believe you can modify the language to say on the soil disclosure rather than the labels. So we don't have to come back and do this again. I know you guys are sick and tired of it. So um, if you have any questions for me, I'm here. Um, other than that, that's all I have to say. The only question I have you used you use the word misleading. What was mis what's misleading? Um, to just that they would not understand what these cleaning processes are. So they would be misled to think that something wrong has happened to it or something bad has happened to it and that they wouldn't want to use it because of that, because they don't understand these terms. Any other board member have questions? Thank you. Thank you guys. Other public speakers. No. Thank you, Chair Douglas. Uh, David Goldwater representing the Indian Fine Cannabis Dispenser. Yeah, I also submitted a letter I'll refer you to, so I don't go into too much depth. Just to let you know that at the, at the dispensary level, um, disclosure and labeling is something we, we want to be compliant with and, and uh, exercise your will to make sure that the consumers are informed um, and how you see fit, however you see fit. I think it's worthwhile, however, to um, maybe share with you that in, in this industry, maybe unlike other industry, when the product is transferred from the wholesale, from the wholesaler to the retailer, it does not come over fully labeled. Uh, at the dispensary level, we, we have to put an extra label on it. And it appears to me that in, in this particular regulation, we are burdened with this extra piece, but I think we can work around it as, as Ms. Cronkite mentioned in the various ways you have accommodated us. But it appears that some of the ill-defined terms like any thermal process would, would make it incumbent on the dispensary to, to understand or know whether or not that occurred, regardless of what the wholesaler tells us. And there simply is, is no, uh, no way for us to know that. Uh, to me, I, I think Mr. Pulitz's comments were appropriate. This may belong in the soil amendment, but I leave that to you uh, as well as uh, make myself available to answer any questions about what is actually happening at the dispensary level regarding label. Question for you based upon your statement. What information are you provided as to the product? We are provided with the laboratory results and we are provided with all the soils and those are the items that we print and then put on the label. Thank you. Yes, sir. Other, other questions by board members? Yeah, this, this is Member Young. Thank you. I, are there any additional information that goes on the label that you are required to place on there currently? Uh, uh, thank you, Member Young. David Goldwater again. Yes, there are some disclosures that are required that we put in the receipt in the bag that are required by law and regulation. Again, a follow-up question, if I could. But these are the disclosures that are required for all product, right? I mean, is there anything specific that you're required for a certain batch or lot that you have to apply onto the label? Yes, sir. I didn't go over again. There are um, the top three terpenes, for example, are required individually per lot on each on each individual product, as well as the required disclosures. Number direct, but I. But what does the dispensary add that's unique from the cultivation? Just establishment name? So establishment name. There are some other, you know, there, there are some uh, safety warnings, for example, that we print on our receipt. Other people put on different places, but on the product affixed to or with the product is uh, the term means the establishment name, the lot number. Those, those are the, those are required. Chief Cronkite, for the record, um, I would just like to clarify that um, all cannabis or cannabis products leaving cultivation or production must have a label. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be affixed to every single individual package, but they could bulk package 
So that label would be maybe on the outside of the box. And so that dispensary should have all that information, just as if a product was extracted using butane, that information is required to be on the label leaving production. And so that would carry over to the dispensary. Remember, for the record, um, Kara, the, if it's an edible product that has to be attached, the label has to be attached and the option of just including it is not available, right? Um, Kara Crockett, for the record, that has actually recently changed. So now it is consistent with all cannabis and cannabis products. Anything that was considered um, very important, such as um, certain warnings or ingredients or allergens has been moved to a packaging requirement. And so anything that would be more of a disclosure um, or um, THC content, things that change regularly, that has been moved to the label, which can be included with. Okay. Thank you. And I guess just for a point of clarification, um, obviously everything that the cultivators and producers give to the dispensary, we we disclose. My question is in this particular regulation, um, when, when the definitions are a little bit looser with any thermal process, it is still incumbent on the dispensary to know, even if the cultivator doesn't provide that. Um, at least in my reading of this regulation, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected. But if that is the case. Um, Good question. Uh, back to our staff, ask that question. I'm Kara Cronkite for the record. Um, so in this new language for 12.065, we tried to be very clear that the process would be approved by a board agent, and it has to be for the purpose of reducing or eradicating microbial contamination. So that thermal process, the cultivator would be very aware if it is an approved process for that purpose, and then they should be putting it on the label. Um, but that responsibility would go to the cultivator or the producer, whoever was treating the cannabis and not necessarily, uh, the onus wouldn't necessarily go on to the dispensary. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, Member Durant, for the record. If you could kind of uh, imagine what the dispensaries, what their um, reaction to this is gonna be, would it, do you think they're just not going to buy from these cultivators anymore? I've heard that, that this, this is only going to affect about 15% of cultivations. Do you think the answer will maybe be, well, it's just too complicated, or do you think it will just be to incorporate it into your new business practices on, from dispensary point of view? Thank you, Member Durrett. Uh, David Goldwagen, in practice, will I don't want to not be compliant. So let, let, I'll just speak for myself. And we pay very careful attention to what comes over from the cultivator to make sure everything's labeled correctly. If I were to miss a, a, a batch that came over uh, or somebody fat fingered something and didn't put the put something in there, I, I'm more at risk. I would be, I would be more likely to only buy from people who did not engage in any thermal process whatsoever just to avoid any risk at all. That makes sense. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other public comment. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board, Amanda Connor from Connor and Connor for the record. I just wanted to comment that the proposed regulation 12.065 contemplates requirements to be on labels. However, the regulations relating to labels 12.030, 12.035, 12.040, and 12.045 do not incorporate this requirement language. And in fact, in those regulations, it says that the la label must be in substantially the following form and does not have an option to add this required disclosure. Therefore, there is a conflict in this proposed regulation and the current adopted regulations. I'd recommend that clarification be added, as Mr. Goldwater just commented, and I've heard from a lot of people in the industry, there is concern about taking on the compliance risk of accepting these products, especially when the regulations are not clear with regards to labeling when they conflict, and therefore I'd recommend the board address that. Thank you. 
other public comment? Good morning. For the record, I'm Kimberly Maxie Rushton with the law firm Cooper Levinson, appearing on behalf of Brad Source Technologies. As this board is aware, you've been entertaining this regulation for over two years. I think that is a clear red flag that there are issues with the regulation. It started with Rad's objection to it based on the fact that we believe that it was targeted specifically for Rad and was otherwise arbitrary and capricious. And then as the recent versions of the new regulation changed, you heard from members of the industry stating their concerns with labeling this for no reason, the concerns with the fact that their product won't be sold at dispensaries, and now that's been further confirmed by the testimony you've heard today. In the letter that I submitted in support of repealing this regulation, I specifically enumerated, again to my colleague, Ms. Connor, the legal infirmities with this regulation, specifically those statutory. This does not tie to any statute, and there's never been an express intent uh, disclosed by the state as to why we need this regulation. I think it's very important that you know as regulators that no other state in the nation requires this. None. Other states deal with decontamination and they treat it the way that it should be, as a positive, as one in which it is better for the consumer's health and safety, in which it should be utilized if possible in order to, again, prevent the development of microbials post-testing. You now have information in front of you that demonstrates that there are certain cannabis products that when they are not treated are more likely to develop microbials faster post-testing than treated cannabis. That's fine, that's the cultivator's prerogative, but if you're going to open up a regulation that deals with the health of the ultimate consumer, you cannot turn a blind eye to that specific fact. So you have multiple legal infirmities. This is not a general application. You've heard from the industry and the fact that it's overly burdensome to them as a whole, not just one segment, but as a whole. And you've been presented with vast amounts of scientific information that demonstrate clearly that there is no scientific basis for a regulation that evidences a warning or any type of standard that there may be some harm to the to a human or to the flower. There's just, that's simply not there. So based on those three reasons, the legal infirmities, the lack of scientific evidence supporting this regulation, and the burden that this will cause on the industry. On behalf of RAD, we respectfully request that the regulation be repealed. As always, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I understand that, but you've been at the public meetings in the past. You've heard some public testimony by people who are not in the industry saying they'd like to know what's in the product. Um, and I understand the, the industry's concern, um, but some public individuals have voiced, their voice has been, we wanna know what, what's there. I understand a lot of people, other people don't care. They like the certain safety of buying from lawful, lawfully uh, stores this product. So they know they don't have fentanyl problems and other problems that could kill them. But we do have a segment that people want to know what's in it. It may be 1%, 2%, I don't know. Uh, so that's that's the concern back and forth. And that's where we try to whittle down the verbiage as to what has to be put. In. And I'd ask for a little show and tell at least to see what the response was as to how you could satisfy this new ask. Um, you're, you're right in terms of not specifically required by legislation, but I guess the general public has asked whether that's enough to push it over the threshold. I don't know at this point, but that's why we wanna hear the comments today and also hear the, uh, the response as to uh, the people in the cannabis agency as to why we're doing this or, or how, it's, how it can be done so it's not overly burdensome. Um, yes, sir, Chair Douglas, for the record, can really rush in. Um, I always believe that in situations such as this, that the best approach is to give you alternatives. 
And so I think that uh, you heard one from Mr. Pulitz, and I believe other cultivators support that relative to adding the, amend the language to the soil amendments. One thing that I indicated in the letter that I sent is one defining decontamination. The state of Colorado defines it. It's very healthy based. It demonstrates to the consumer that this is for their protection. And then uh, Chair Douglas and members of the board, you could add the, the various approved treatment processes to your website so that consumers know these have been approved for your safety. And that's what's the most important. I think as you've heard the comments from the members of the industry, what's concerning here is that this started off as a warning and, and it morphed. And so while we're happy with the language, it still has that optic. Um, and that was the basis for the comment about it being misleading to the public. We don't want the public to think that simply because their, pro their product has been decontaminated, that there's some safety issue there or health issue. There's none. The science supports that. And so for those reasons, what we're advocating is that you embrace the idea of treatment as being a positive for the industry, and then you find an alternative that isn't otherwise overly burdensome and doesn't prevent a certain segment of the industry from no longer treating their product because of the fact that they can't then thereafter sell it because of these onerous labeling obligations. So I um, respectfully submit that if you're not inclined to repeal it, that you look at the alternative methods proposed by both RAD as well as the cultivators. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. this is this member, yeah, I just had a uh, question for you, if I could, please. Um, why the difference between being on the label versus being on the soil? So, I mean, what's the difference? But why is it, why should we change it to the soil amendments versus being on the label? In response to your question, Dr. Young, Kimberly Rushton, I, I defer to the cultivators, but it's my understanding that they that, that information on the soil amendment would not otherwise dunk up the label, uh, it require them additional cost and efforts in order to amend the labels. And that is the first point of view for a consumer. And so while they know that the certificates of analysis are available on the soil amendments, I would say you probably don't ask for them unless they really are looking for that information. So you're, you're meeting the objective, Dr. Young. If someone wants to know how their product is treated, they will specifically ask for the certificate of analysis and the soil amendment, and then that will provide them the necessary information. Otherwise, I think the cultivator's position is don't ask us to add something to the label that could otherwise mislead a patient or a, a consumer into thinking that there's something harmful about the product. Yes, sir. Good morning. It's still morning. Good morning, Chairman Douglas, members of the board, esteemed staff, and Mr. Uh, thank you for all your hard work this year. I know this is the last meeting of the year. And thank you for all for hearing our comments uh, about the proposed changes for the um, NCCR 12065. When I say our, I'm talking about our group with our members and ownership and our vertical. Um, we're not asking for the labeling to be on or off. In fact, our position is that the patients and their physicians need to know about the treatment and all other information on what the patients will be exposed to. However, we are asking the board to consider the medical, scientific, ethical, and economic impact of this vote before you make a final decision. Scientifically, when an any medicinal product is labeled or will be directly on the packaging or the bottle. It is usually a warning to direct patients' focus and attention to an important life-threatening message. Like, this medicine might <clears throat> make you drowsy, can't drive with it, don't operate heavy machinery. Uh, this product may cause cancer. Our group uses a treatment protocol that we have used to clean human blood before, we, before transfusion to make sure no infection is introduced to the patient. There is no warning requirement medically post blood treatment this process. Pesticides, on the other hand, are used to destroy hydrocarbon organisms, which we are all, all humans are made of. <clears throat> However, pesticides used, used are not required 
from old labeling warning patients. Instead, they are placed on the soil amendment. And I think, Dr. Young, maybe this is a partial response to your question. Um, uh, also, why is 12065 only requiring treatment disclosures after the death of the plant at post harvest? As opposed to during the time that the plant is alive and is absorbing the highest concentration of chemicals into its live tissue, which will be present. I mean, as a, as an organism grows, whatever is taken in, pesticides, nutrients, they'll all go inside the tissue. So I don't understand. <clears throat> That's just the question I have. Um, economically speaking, the impact of this labeling of all the products at the cultivation and again at the production, and again at all the dispensaries will add another step <clears throat> to an existing laborious, tedious, and cumbersome process. These additional steps will make it much less profitable for the dispensaries and across the board. Most likely the retail stores would rather not carry the product than go through the expense. This issue will be resolved if the warning label will be placed on the soil amendment and available to all patients, along with the treatments that the plant has gone through through its entire life cycle, nutrients, anything else that's there. And that's where it is now, Dr. Young. <clears throat> Ethically, in the last meeting regarding the NCCR 12065, a couple of months ago back, there's a lot of discussion, both pro and con, regarding this issue. Some groups have, groups have requested to have another workshop to go over all these issues. It is well recognized that this item has been on the agenda a few times, and, it, and there's a sense of urgency to get it over with. Um, but a workshop from two years ago cannot be responsive to the issues of today. This is not the same industry as of two years ago. Our largest producer of a cannabis in this state has filed bankruptcy. We are paying 35%, not 15% on taxes, not including state sales tax, local taxes, and jurisdictional taxes and the 2 tax cutback paybacks that we're getting. That leaves us at an approximate 50 to 60% overall cost before we open doors. Hence, the black market is thriving, and the average pound of cannabis is selling for sub $1,000. The industry has gone through three governing bodies, each with its own set of regulations. To add more regulations and burden on the industry before completely vetting the current issues does not afford the industry to process. <clears throat> but that's just my opinion. Completely wrong. <laughs> uh, um, and this last part, I'm not sure if I can discuss it because it's not, it's outside of 12065. But from what I understand, there's been discussion regarding abandoning the medical cannabis program. I believe this is devastating for our patients. The whole reason this industry is here is because of our cannabis being a medicine for our patients and us as providers to be able to supply it to our patients, like my mom, who had cancer and died, died eventually, but she survived with cannabis at high doses. Um, the patients require significantly higher levels of THC to manage the pain, nausea, PTSD, and other disease processes. Please don't take that medical cannabis away from our patients. Thank you and happy holidays. So, this is Mary I have a follow up question. Oh, I'm First, sorry. Thank you for being here today. I'm sorry. Uh, secondly, um, the are you against the disclosure to the public or are you just against the disclosure being on the label? On the label. I, 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 in fact, I, I, I believe the opposite. I think all of our patients should know. Uh, what's what's in, in, uh, contained uh, in what they're eating, consuming, smoking, or, or vaping, whatever they're doing. It's, I just don't think it's appropriate to have it on a label with some warning that really scares customers and patients away. Uh, Dr. Yang, you and I had a discussion, and I think you brought up the fact that if you had a cancer patient, you would recommend uh, the patient to go and, and find a product that's been treated with uh, um, uh, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I, I, I think it was a, a thermal or a rat source, I don't remember what it was, uh, which you believe that the microbial levels would be so much less 
uh, once it's packaged in, in some sort of plastic, that it, the, the microbes will have an opportunity to, to regrow. Uh, just yeah, specifically regarding that conversation, no, I, I, I did not say I would personally recommend that to patients. I that you know, an oncologist might, maybe that or a patient might just search that on their own. Um, and actually, in, in follow-up, I would just say that I would actually not have an issue with a patient using any of the cannabis products since they're essentially they're all safe. Um, and I have some comments at the end, but but, but thank you for coming in today. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I didn't mean to uh, miss, miss, miss speak. I was at a conversation about two months ago, so I don't remember who was recommending it and what, but that was what I retained from that conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment, please. Good afternoon, members of the board, Chair Davis. My name is Matthew Blevin, representing Circle S Farms. We are here to talk about today the devastating effects that this labeling will do to cultivators. And when I do say will do, I absolutely mean that. Uh, this industry is very tight knit. Cultivators consistently speak with GMs, purchasers, et cetera, from the dispensary side of this business. It has been stated that any extra effort that has to be taken place by the dispensary will result in the lack of purchase of this material. That is, I believe, what we are trying to avoid in this. Initially, I was gonna come up here and bombard you guys with massive amounts of facts from all the scientific data, but we've heard plenty of that today, I would imagine. But there was, is one that I would like to bring your attention. Between 2000 and 2004, the USDA made an attempt to educate consumers on the irradiation practice. But yet, I would imagine over 99% of us knew nothing of this practice prior to us being involved in this current situation. The last meeting, I actually stood up here and presented every single person in this room the Redura symbol, which showed what the irradiation process should display on any item that has been used. Not a single person in this room recognized that symbol. So I'm not going to stand here and say that we as an industry do not have a louder voice than the USDA, but I might go to say that if there was an attempt made, they did this and it did not work. What we are going to do is we are going to misinform, I am going to use that word, we are going to misinform our consumer that this is not a safe product. Not for the fact that it is not a safe product, but for the word radiation. Most people hear that word and immediately negative connotation to that word, immediately, without having done any research whatsoever on what the process is. I would be willing to put on a trial basis that this product that is coming out from anybody using a red source, which that's the only method that we are familiar with, that we are going to speak on, is a much better product than what is available on any shelf sustained other cannabis that is not utilizing it for the simple method of decontaminating and killing all active DNA in this product. What happens when this product sits on the shelves? It is growing microbials in that packaging, in that packaging that has, I believe, been tested, maybe not presented, and shown that this product is, would now fail the active required testing that you all have put in place that required for us to be able to sell these to our patients and our consumers. So at what point do we not start reversing this question and asking ourselves, should we not be asking the people not utilizing this method to post warnings on their product that this may contain after certain amounts of time, unsafe microbial in their product that they are purchasing? What is the time frame for that? We have established shelf lives on production items, saying that this is unsafe to consume for our, for our customers. At what point does a flower that has not been treated unsafe? There are diseases, Aspergillus pulmonary, that is a known fact since the 80s. People ingesting cannabis with high amounts of Aspergillus inside of it, causing real medical conditions and fatal conditions. But yet the conversation has not gone into the fact that we are not utilizing this. Instead, we are going after the people that are providing a sterile product, longer shelf life, 
to the consumer. We are not saying do not inform our customers of this. We are saying let's not scare them away. Let's not cripple an industry that is already under extreme duress at this point. I believe that is what everybody here is asking. We would like a fair practice, a fair understanding to be able to put this information out in a way that it is not going to harm our industry. That's all. Any questions? Thank you. Will Adler, for the record, with the Social State Government Relations. I just had a point of clarification or sort of a question in general. Uh, we, we have a, a fill in the blank sort of for the first time in a label here. You, we usually have a do or a don't have or a percentage in or not inside the product. Uh, today, we're having a you know, method of treatment that has to be filled in. So my, my one concern is chain of you know, operations and ownership of the product. Uh, you know, the, the person who has to, to first treat it has to also put the label on it of what was treated. When it comes to a dispensary, we're, we're, we are trusting that label. But again, uh, if the label is incorrect uh, and the treatment was a different method than used, you know, it was a heat method used rather than a radiation method used, and we are, you know, sending that to the consumer on our label today. Uh, again, is it the dispensary's fault for having it on there incorrectly, or we were given the incorrect treatment on the product when it came to us, right? So I just, I, I would prefer if it didn't have a fill in the blank even, or does it has required the secondary treatment post harvest or something like that, but uh, that, that's my one point of uh, clarification is, you know, having more uh, human errors available will create more human errors. So maybe isolating this or, or minimizing it and, uh, you know, having this documentation is is somewhat valuable in some ways, but all products in Nevada do have a, a very stringent level of testing today. So uh, just my, my clarification would be more around, uh, as long as it's labeled, it's not, it's not the fault of those who produce it to the customer that the label was you know, correct maybe because if it didn't be amended later, it's not our fault as the seller of that product, correct? Kara? Mm -hmm. Kara Crockett for the record, but I, I believe that's been asked and answered already. And the onus of the accuracy of the information okay, did. goes to whoever provided you that information. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, my name is John Marshall. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Deep Roots Harvest, and I want to echo all the sentiments here today. Um, you know, this industry is very burdensome on a lot of regulatory levels, most of which we have no problem complying with. And I think when you look at the radiation technologies that are out there, it's, it's well proven that they're very effective. They put out a cleaner product to the market. And I think that a soil disclosure like Nick um, attested to is a, is a very good place to put that, you know, the pre-harvest versus post-harvest treatment of product should be synonymous and one and the same. We're not required to put pesticides and fertilizers and nutrients and everything else on a label. So I don't understand why you would put a, a radiation on the label. I, I am supportive of putting that in the soil disclosure though. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I could say officially good afternoon now. Hi, Rob Snerland here with uh, DEC Ops, a uh, local co cultivator here in Clark County. I'd just like to echo many of the statements here, my fellow colleagues. I think this language is overly broad, will lead to unintended consequences and misunderstanding. It's not based on science, many of these comments, but I think personal opinion. I have a father who's been going through chemo, and I would select something that's been clean and I know is not full of microbials for him. And in fact, I have. And to create this alarmist language is not based on science and lead misunderstanding. I don't think it's a positive move forward for the industry at a time the industry is absolutely struggling. If the board does decide to move forward, I would though support, I think the appropriate place is the soil amendment, like you've heard from many of my colleagues. Uh, the stuff that goes into the plant pre-harvest it's going to have the biggest impact for this plant that just absorbs everything in the soil and things around it. So if we want to disclose and inform the public, there is an appropriate and consistent place to do that. And I do believe that is the soil amendment. Thank you for hearing me out. Anyone else in the audience wish to come forth? <laughs> Whoa. 
Good afternoon. Oh, let me get close to the mic. My name is Selfie Boyajian. I'm here representing Flower One. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, happy holidays. I know we're all trying to stay in the spirit here. And it's been actually tough for me to figure out what I wanted to come up here and say exactly, because I've been struggling to find the right words to make sure I'm conveying the correct message that we're all trying to get across here. I don't think anyone is denying that there's a process that's happening, but it's really making sure that it goes back to the same theme. And that's why I'm not here to just keep repeating, but I just wanted to make my point. Making sure that the way in which this information is being presented or identified on the label or how it's being brought out to the consumer, that is the key issue here. I was reading a bunch of the different public comments that either are or are not in support of this. Just reading what people are writing shows me how much misinformation is out there. People are all calling this radiation. This is not radiation. Irradiation and radiation are two very different things. But a lot of the world out there is very much misinformed. And that's why we are saying they're going to misunderstand the intent of what this means by putting it on the compliance label. The compliance label is meant to tell you the basic information that you know as an avid cannabis user myself. I was one of the first actually to go seek out some kind of process or help to make sure the flower that I'm gonna be growing and putting out to the public is safe. Because these are things ethically, not just legally, ethically as a user myself wanted to ensure were addressed because this is the new industry that I was entering. I wanted us to be, as we all keep saying, we wanna be the gold standard here in Nevada. And that's why sometimes we do above and beyond. All of us license holders are trying to always go above and beyond. Life is tough right now in this industry. That's very well been made clear here. So I think we're just really trying to reinforce why we're up here again, month after month, every time this comes up to restate what we've been stating all along. I don't think at the end of the day, appropriate and fair compromise here, if that's what you want to call it, or somehow that we can all get along and just meet somewhere that, yes, information should be put out there. It's actually going to turn in a minute when you don't do this kind of method, you're actually potentially putting people at risk. I don't know how much information and data is out there on flower that's been sitting on shelves and how long after. Do a follow-up test. We've actually done this, but it's not a legitimate, I can't do a study, so I'm not going to sit here and present that. But I'm open to doing that if we can actually put something together to go test flower that's been sitting on shelves three months and six months down the line to see what those CFAs look like, to see the difference between processes, those that have gone through the irradiation process and those that have not. Again, there's also foods we eat. There's many things that everyone is currently ingesting today that has been irradiated, that none of us are aware of. It is not on the packaging. I've searched and searched in the supermarkets I don't do a lot of shopping, but I looked. So I'm trying to, and again, if I could find a connection, would be more than happy to stand here and figure out how to do this better. But I think that's at the end of the day, all we're trying to say is don't give off the wrong idea to the consumers. It's actually the opposite of what this is doing. And that's all I'm here to say. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Anyone else in Clark County? Let's try Northern Nevada and Carson City. Do we have any public comment in Carson City? There does not appear to be any public comment in Carson City. This opens it up to the board. Uh, I'd like to get comments from Member Young, um, as the one who actually went to science class, opposed to the rest of us on the board. Uh, but having said that, uh, I have my own vent at this point, uh, but I'd like to hear from Dr. Young. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I will try to be somewhat brief. Uh, the first thing I'd like to address is the safety issue. And, and I agree that there's the products that undergo radiation are safe. You know, specifically, if we talk about rad source, that radiation is not transferred onto the product. The product is safe, and, and in no way have we ever said that it's anything but that. Uh, but it is. But you can't say it's safer than the rest of the industry because that information doesn't exist. And it's not true. 
And we're talking about you know, a 15%. So although it does make the product safe, it's, it's not safer than, than the products that don't undergo pollution. Um, you know, I, I, I look at this, this and I agree with uh, 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 Councillor Rushton in that this, this has morphed into a very different than what we started with. Uh, and that you've, now this has become a public uh, information uh, release and that the public has clearly shown to us with all of their comments that, that they want disclosure of this information. And, and I think that that's reason enough that, that we should forward. Uh, I think we've heard enough comments now from the industry that they also, for the most part, other than possibly rad source agree you know, that disclosure is appropriate, but now the issue is where do we put it? Uh, I believe that the most appropriate place for the disclosure is on the label uh, because it is plot and batch specific. The other issue with the soil in this is that I believe those are very difficult to come across. Um, and, and I don't want to bury this, this information uh, that the public wants. So uh, my feelings that I, I'm in the camp of supporting public disclosure and, and placing this current, uh, current regulation labeling uh, on the label itself. I hope that's clear. Let me throw out something just to see what uh, how it plays. I guess the real concern I have, we wanna make sure the public is aware. The question as a baby step to, Sarah, to, to Ms. Cronkite to you would, information given in the so soil disclosure be a, a good step or at least a first step or do you think what what you're proposing is is where we need to go Eric Cronkite for the record um the soil amendment report is, is just to the idea is to disclose anything that's been added to the growing plant the soil how has the soil been amended nutrients, pesticides, um, anything like that. And so not even necessarily negative things, just everything that's been applied to it in case somebody has a sensitivity or, or just would like to know. Um, and then anything that's done or applied to the plant post-harvest always goes on the label. So if it's extraction, extracted, the method of extraction goes on the label. Um, that, that's always how we have separated it. That's what makes sense to me personally. Um, and, you know, additionally, like with the FDA, if you buy food products that have been treated um, for with, you know, they've been irradiated, for example, you'd see the Radura symbol. You, they, the FDA does require that foods which are remediated or which are treated with irradiation are labeled as such, um, you know, and, and I don't think it necessarily has a, a negative um, connotation. I heard from a lot of people today saying that they would recommend people get products that have been remediated and or treated. And um, I don't think anyone would really know that without it being on the label. We receive complaints regularly that the few consumers who do know that they can request a soil amendment report, when they have requested them, they haven't been available. Um, you know, uh, I just don't think it's something that people know they can request. And I think if they did know they could request it here in the soil amendment, they wouldn't think things like post-harvest treatment. And so that's not where they would go for that information, such as um, if it has been decontaminated in any way. And the second question I have for you, you did it earlier, but in general with the first part that we brought up, but. The compliance notices, are those the same as what you showed us before? And if you would reshow it. Correct. So a compliance label, and here's a photo of a label on a fixed tool package, um, just as an example. And then um, you could just take that label and not affix it and just place it in the exit bag with the product. Um, it could be printed, it could be affixed, it could be really however you want. It could even be a QR code or a handout. Um, 
It just does have to have that product specific information. Um, so that last one, the QR code would just be, if you're interested, it would be within that. Correct. Okay. Other board members. Mr. Chairman, this is a uh, member Nylander and uh, I, I apologize. I think I, I'd like to hear Dr. Young on this, but what if the, so the, the current regulation and by the way, we are on one, two, three, four, five, six drafts. So I have yellow, purple, green, orange, and blue, and some other color. I guess it's brown. I don't know. But so this has been hashed out. But and and, and I I apologize if I don't if I'm not recalling correctly, but. What if the term treatment, you know, where, where we talk about treatment, what if there's a statement later that says, you know, even though this has been treated, it's, uh, it's passed all Nevada regulations and is safe for consumer consumption or would that help at all? Or is that not, is that, has that been discussed and not? Included. This is, this is never again. I don't know if this is more appropriate for me or for Deputy Cronkite, but you know that would. I just don't want to imply that this is safer than other products. So if you're going to have that on the label for this because it's been remediated, then I think you have that on every label saying this product is safe. And I think it's also somewhat implied that it's safe because it's already been tested and is available for. You know, for you to purchase it. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. So that's been considered, and it's, uh, you know, probably may create more problems than it helps. Yeah. So I, I understand. Thank you. Karen Wright, did you have a? Um, Karen Cronkite, for the record, um, we did receive some comments from the industry when we sent out the request for, um, for recommendations on how to word the label. And that is why we added for the purpose of reducing microbial contamination. Um, I'm not sure if that helps answer your question, board member, Highlander. Um, the, the label itself would read, for example, this product has been treated with ozone for the purpose of reducing microbial contamination, something like that. Yeah, no, I'm looking at that right now. Again, um, no, that makes sense. I, yeah, I, I, if I could just follow that. The, yeah, and, and that wording for microbial contamination, uh, reducing microbial contamination was to get rid of deep contamination and then make it a connotation that might go into that. Yeah, no, uh, okay. That, that, I'm sorry, can you repeat that statement, please? I'm sorry, this, this was Member Young. Um, I was responding to saying that the wording reducing microbial contamination in the, in, on the labeling, the part of the reason for that change in the wording was to get rid of the word decontamination and possible negative connotations associated with that. No, thank you, Dr. Young. That, that makes sense. I was, I, I may be oversimplifying it, but I was thinking of a statement that, you know, it's been tested and it's in compliance with you know, all this regulations, but I think that crafted language already says that. So thanks for the clarification. I understand that. Okay, member direct for the record. Um, I think we should take into consideration that the public comment that has been submitted are probably people who are more invested in this issue and is not representative maybe of a, a much larger pool of consumers. Um, part of the stated public policy of the Cannabis Compliance Board is to, of course, protect public health, but also protect public trust. Um, so I do think part of the public trust would be disclosing this. 
um, even though we'll be the first state to do that, requiring disclosure of this, but, um, and I think very few people are um, saying that it just shouldn't be disclosed. It should be disclosed, but we're not basing where we disclose it on the science. The science is whether or not it's safe and we're not saying it's safe or not. Um, it hasn't been proven safe. It hasn't been proven unsafe. So we're not basing where we place it on the science. We're basing it on our policy and our thoughts about the policy. And my thought about the policy is that those people who are invested in finding out um, how this product, project, product has been treated, um, whether it's safe for them, um, that they are the savvier buyers and that they um, are more likely aware of the soil amendment, or if they're not, they should be, and that should be a separate conversation. How do we make them more aware of this soil amendment? I don't think we just say, or oh, our soil amendments don't aren't effective, so let's not have them anymore. Let's um, put it with the soil amendment, call it the soil and treatment amendments and make the public aware of them. So I think I'm an outlier on this, but I do think that it should be go along with the soil amendments, which I did you know it's been two years, but five months ago in the July hearing, I said, I don't think this should go on the label. I think it should go on the soil amendment. So thank you for letting me say that. I just personally feel that there is a fiduciary responsibility to the consumer. I'm sorry, who's speaking right now? Jerry Merritt. Oh, thank, thank you. I was just saying that I personally feel that there's a fiduciary responsibility to the consumer that they have the ability to be made aware that there is a caution of any kind. As I can sit here and listen to the conversation today, I'm thinking of myself personally, is there anything that I would want to inhale or digest that I am actually consuming that I was not aware that there could possibly be a risk? or if there have even been some statement about the fact that there could be this. I'm also listening to voices today, uh, just like uh, my board member said just a few minutes ago, maybe ones from the industry thinking about how it will affect the sales you know, of the product. But I think first, if there was not a consumer that was actually purchasing the product, we would not even be having this conversation. So I really do feel that the consumer should actually be made aware. Um, again, uh, where we put it or how we state it, uh, those are issues that can be discussed. But yes, the consumer should definitely be made aware of this caution. Yeah, the, Mr. Chairman, this is Member Nylander. Uh, total agreement with Member Merritt. Um, I think there needs to be a disclosure. And what this regulation does is it just provides the minimum. You know, they, they can add something else on the label if they want to, you know, saying it's been tested, it's approved, it's, you know, it's all good to go, you know, whatever they want to add. Like, this is just the minimum disclosure to the public, to the consumer. So I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, uh, well, that's it, Mr. Chairman, for me. If we have a member of the board who wants to make or attempt to fashion a motion, I'd like to hear it at this point, one way or the other, as the where we're at. Well, this is Member Young. I would, I would motion that we approve the changes in Regulation Twelve Point Zero Six Five uh, as stated on today's agenda. This, this is Member Nylander. I would second that motion. We have a motion. And we have a second. Additional discussion. For myself, additional discussion. It gives me some pause, so to speak, that we are trying to get information out for the public. We are not trying to burden the industry. I was appreciative of kind of the show and tell I asked for as to the notice so that the notice would not be overbearing, which is, I understand part of the concern 
of the industry uh, and understand that this day does not stamp this in perpetuity, so to speak. It's a stab at doing, uh, doing something to notice the public and not uh, hurt the industry. I understand the industry does feel it hurts them. Uh, we think it's kind of a, a small step. And we also understand it's tough out there right now. That's my only comment. Uh, with that, uh, all in favor of the motion that has been made in second, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes will be four to one and the direct oppose. What do we have left to clarify on the record in terms of which we are, what's been advanced for regulation changes today? Max and we'll talk to you after this is over because we had done something when you weren't here. Um, our next, well, before that briefing from the chair and the executive director, um, had an opportunity to go to a series of meetings last week by regulators across the country. Uh, we're very pleased with the federal action of okay, at least study on cannabis. Uh, for the public, it was okay. Hopefully, it's a first step in a change for the better. Still concerned as to what's occurring with the banking bill nationally that would allow for uh, the use of banks without restrictions, allowing for available monies and loans, uh, and to kind of show the flag in a better position. This is not an illegal industry. People keep saying, well, the cartels and illegal activity. But we're talking about legal activity. We're talking about mothers and fathers and caregivers buying something that's legal in a large, in most of the jurisdictions in the United States today. So hopefully it's a good first step. But the jury is still out. Also heard some really concerns, though, about where the federal government gets in, into this and uh, interstate commerce, some of the things that were brought up in our last discussion about product and flour, if we get into interstate and uh, how we deal with what sits on your shelves in the future for the retailers, how long it's been there, if we start getting out of state products. So that's a whole Pandora's box that we haven't even opened yet. That's gonna have to be dealt with in the regulators. So yeah, it's a scary and interesting time all, all at the same time. Uh, as I indicated, we are we have some states that have social equity programs across the board. One of the social equity programs they have across the board gives what we refer to as our legacy market uh, or illegal cannabis providers an opportunity coming out of the cold. They can make make a business decision: do they want to get out of the illegal business and get into the legal business? From their standpoint, they take a hit because now they have to pay taxes like our legal folks, but they don't have the law looking over their shoulder. Uh, a lot of states are looking at that. I don't know if Nevada will look at implementing something like that or not, but there's a lot of, I don't use the term stuff out there that hopefully will eventually help our legal marketplace. Uh, and uh, I, I know it seems from your standpoint, looking at the board that we are not as helpful as you would like us to be. Uh, we are trying to do what's being asked by the legislature in terms of public safety and, and protecting the public. But we understand that that's all good, but the industry has to survive and the industry has to go forth. And uh, you're going to make money. We understand that. We don't want to stand in the way of that. But there's a balance someplace I don't have a clue right now. 
we'll, we'll hear the interesting discussions what our legislature does and what they think of. Tyler? Thank you, Tyler Clemens, for the record, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank uh, the CCB team and board agents for their work leading up to November 30th, which was our random number selector event um, to move forward with selecting the 20 uh, cannabis lounge, independent lounge applicants that we're going to move forward in the process. Um, I think facilitating a competitive licensing round in, in any industry is, is, is probably difficult, but in in cannabis world, even more so. So um, the work touched every corner of our agency. Um, nobody got a free pass as far as our team goes in working um, uh, and, and, and leading up to, to November 30th. So thank you to everybody, our legal counsel as well. Could not have done it without you. And this is simply the next phase uh, in the licensing process as we move forward with lounges. And so board, you should be very uh, uh, proud of your your, your staff here uh, for the work that they did. One other thing that as Mr. Klamath and I have been kind of on the road a little bit with some things, we had one meeting with a group of people out of the industry. We intend to have additional quote, non-public meetings because we can have more open and frank discussions we can really talk back and forth about things. Uh, we didn't do much more of that this upcoming year because we are an industry or you are an industry that you've been taking baby steps, crawling, um, standing up straight. So it's like we need to have open dialogue between both the regulators and the industry and the public uh, in forums where we can kind of flesh out a little bit better uh, the questions on the board and the difficulties or where it's difficult to see if we can make them smoother or better. And in some cases, just to flesh out how cannabis compliance works from the standpoint of regulators coming onto your property or the licensing and what's asked and the uniformity of it. So that the process it still may be burdensome, but it's a lot easier because you easier because you understand how it works. Or you're telling us, yeah, we see how it works. That's not working for us. Can you make these changes? Uh, that's how things get better. That's what we hope to do in the upcoming year. Uh, but that's kind of the, the report back to you. Our next meeting is scheduled in that wonderful year of 2023, which has had no missteps yet on the 4th of, excuse me, the 24th of January. And uh, items for future agendas, I guess we've had the proposal and, and now we're with a new governor in place and teams kind of going and bill drafts starting to be dropped. Uh, we will have some form of communication as to those bill drafts uh, coming up and whether we actually put them on our meeting or have a place for them or whether it's just board communication that's yet to be seen. So this is the time for public, additional public comment, if any. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board staff, uh, Amanda Connor for the record. I just wanted to thank everyone for an incredible year. The Cannabis Compliance Board has come so far since the first meeting, um, and I think a lot has been accomplished this year. Um, thank you to staff and the board for all their hard work. Happy holidays, and we'll see you in 2023. Thank you. Any other public comment? We need comment up north. Part of the pledge always is end our meeting the same day we started. We're in adjournment. <laughs> <laughs>